I have often observed women when they are trying on hats, and have wondered why salespeople do not read the prospective buyer's mind by watching her manner of handling the hats. A woman goes into a store and asks to be shown some hats. The salesperson starts bringing out hats, and the prospective buyer starts trying them on. If a hat suits her, even in the slightest sort of way, she will keep it on a few seconds or a few minutes, but if she does not like it, she will pull it right off her head the moment the salesperson takes her hands off the hat. Finally, when the customer is shown a hat that she likes, she will begin to announce that fact, in terms which no well-informed salesperson will fail to understand, by arranging her hair under the hat, or pulling it down on her head to just the angle which she likes best, and by looking at the hat from the rear with the aid of a hand mirror. The signs of admiration are unmistakable. Finally, the customer will remove the hat from her head and begin to look at it closely. Then she may lay it aside and permit another hat to be tried on her, in which event the clever salesperson will lay aside the hat just removed, and at the opportune time she will bring it back and ask the customer to try it on again. By careful observation of the customer's likes and dislikes, a clever saleswoman may often sell as many as three or four hats to the same customer at one sitting, by merely watching what appeals to the customer and then concentrating upon the sale of that. The same rule applies in the sale of other merchandise. The customer will, if closely observed, clearly indicate what is wanted, and if the clue is followed, very rarely will a customer walk out without buying. I believe it a conservative estimate when I say that fully 75% of the walkouts, as the non-purchasing customers are called, are due to lack of tactful showing of merchandise. The man who is afraid to give credit to those who help him do a piece of creditable work is so small that opportunity will pass by without seeing him some day. Hot heads go with cold feet. He who loses his temper is usually a bluffer, and when called, is a quitter. Last fall I went into a hat store to purchase a felt hat. It was a busy Saturday afternoon, and I was approached by a young extra rush-hour salesman who had not yet learned how to size people up at a glance. For no good reason whatsoever, the young man pulled down a brown derby and handed it to me, or rather tried to hand it to me. I thought he was trying to be funny, and I refused to take the hat into my hands, saying to him, in an attempt to return his compliment and be funny in turn, "'Do you tell bedtime stories also?' He looked at me in surprise, but didn't take the cue which I had offered him. If I had not observed the young man more closely than he had observed me, and sized him up as an earnest but inexperienced extra, I would have been highly insulted, for if there is anything I hate, it is a derby of any sort, much less a brown derby. One of the regular salesmen happened to see what was going on, walked over and snatched the brown derby out of the young man's hands, and with a smile on his face intended as a sort of sop to me, said, What the hell are you trying to show this gentleman, anyway? That spoiled my fun, and the salesman who had immediately recognized me as a gentleman sold me the first hat he brought out. The customer generally feels complimented when a salesman takes the time to study the customer's personality and lay out merchandise suited to that personality. I went into one of the largest men's clothing stores in New York City a few years ago and asked for a suit, describing exactly what was wanted but not mentioning price. The young man, who purported to be a salesman, said he did not believe they carried such a suit, but I happened to see exactly what I wanted hanging on a model and called his attention to the suit. He then made a hit with me by saying, Oh, that one over there? That's a high-priced suit. His reply amused me. It also angered me, so I inquired of the young man what he saw about me which indicated that I did not come in to purchase a high-priced suit. With embarrassment he tried to explain, but his explanations were as bad as the original offense, and I started toward the door, muttering something to myself about dumbbells. Before I reached the door I was met by another salesman who had sensed by the way I walked and the expression on my face that I was none too well pleased. With tact well worth remembering, this salesman engaged me in conversation while I unburdened my woes, and then managed to get me to go back with him and look at the suit. Before I left the store I purchased the suit I came in to look at, and two others which I had not intended purchasing. That was the difference between a salesman and one who drove customers away. 
Moreover, I later introduced two of my friends to the same salesman, and he made sizable sales to each of them.